That's good at it. Thank you, Mr. Hills. Everyone, we're going through some technical difficulties. Hopefully, hopefully you can hear us now. Bear with us. We really apologize. We're doing about three or four different things now. We test, I tested out just before the show and everything worked okay. But now we're having some difficulties. Let us know. Okay, Frank the Tank says they can see us. So that's really good. I'll move over so you can see more of Nanette instead of more of me. Um, can you hear us? So Frank the Tank says you can see us, but can you hear us? Let's get that. Sound, weird. sound is weird. Okay, bear with there's us sound. first. What? There's sound. So there's sound, but it's, is it echoey? Um, we're going to try something. It's yes to. Can you hear us? Yep, good now. How is the sound? Is it echoey? I can try one more thing just to make sure that the sound is okay. Again, I apologize for these technical difficulties. We're getting there. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Echoing glitchy sound. Okay, we're going to try one more quick thing here. If this doesn't work, we're going to move on. Make sure the mic is on. The mic is on. Okay. Somebody says, sounds good on my end. Thanks, Nick. Better. And again, I apologize for the performance here. You are going through some of the first two You're wearing black box. Okay, how is that, everybody? Let's get one more. Uh, Bob, Bob M., can you let us know audio, visual, are we okay? And I'm just going through real quick here. And we have Crystal and Frank the Tank, and Chris is on. Chris, your uh, live streams were so crisp and clear and perfect and professional. And here we are struggling with ours. So I apologize again. If you haven't been to the, uh, the Chris, the Matt Aquarius Biggs, make sure you get there and check out his his channel. What's up? No audio, not clear. Okay. I, I plugged in the mic. So we're going to unplug the mic. We're going to try it one more time. And if not, we're just going to move on or we're, we're going to cancel. Bob says, go for it. Sounds a little off. It's fine, though. So I, I'm not sure if it's uh, echoey or, or not. We're going to just go through it. And, okay. It's probably just the way I'm talking. It's probably muddy. Yeah, it's probably me. Um, so. Tonight, I wanted to get everybody together because I get a lot, a lot. I bet you I get three or four questions every single day. And that's cool. I like to answer questions on isopods and isopod setups and geckos and anything. Uh, questions about how to set up a Facebook page. But anyways, I get a lot of questions about isopod setups and what to do. Does this work? Is this okay? And I wanted to open this up and find out if um you guys had questions i do have some comments about isopod setups and i'll talk to you about that in just a minute but we are open right now for questions so if you have questions go ahead and let us know um, from an isopod setup standpoint i've changed my isopod setup so many times from doing it this way to doing it this way i have a couple of uh, videos out there and i'm not too far off on what I've put in the videos and what I'm currently doing. Um, I saw a comment though today that kind of concerned me a little bit, and there were some great, great answers to the comment. Somebody asked about wood pellets. Now, I go all the way back to Russ Wilson, uh, uh, Queer Bats Pets, and Russ put this out a couple of years ago when I first started getting into isopods. Did we see any? Um, pouch, pouch, and Bob, you put it in all caps, and that's just perfect. If you have questions, put a couple of question marks in front of the question, or put it in all caps, and we'll catch those. Um, so the question on the Facebook forum was uh, wood pellets. Uh, should I use wood pellets? Can I use wood shavings? And there were a lot of back and forth on this. And I don't know, is anybody in the chat for their isopod setups, are they? 
hate using wood pellets or shaving. And I'm going to answer how I feel about this in just a second because this is kind of confusing and I've been doing this for, for a couple, two and a half, three years now almost. Um, and this, I'm talking about the wood pellets that you get at like uh, Home Depot or Menards, one of the home improvement stores that you buy in the 40 pound bag. You use it to uh, for barbecuing. Don't don't ever get the wood pellets, the flavored ones. Don't ever get the, the flavored ones. Um, but you can get the unflavored ones, unscented, untreated. I just want to make it make sure that it's safe for your isopod. So the question is, should we use those in enclosures? Yeah, go ahead. Somebody said they use moist and barbecue chips, which I think are wood pellets. I, I think you're right. Who said that? But basement pets. Ah, basement pets. Hi, basement Frank pets. Says he uses wood pellets. Um, now, I'm assuming that everybody is using wood pellets. I, I just brushed my shirt and I should be talking like the godfather here. Um, I use I use wood pellets, but what I'll do is I'll put it in a big, like, 70-quart container. Um, I'll dump them in there, and then I'll put the water on. I'll let it sit for probably a day or so, and then I go in and I kind of, it takes 10 minutes. I crush them up, and then I'll let those sit, and then I'll use those in substrates, uh, my isopod substrates. If you have a... Somebody, um, Frank says he uses the oak pellets. With oh, no flavorings yes. are perfect, and I also use it to make beetle substrates. Yes, yes. The shirt. <clears throat> so thank you very much. Shirt. And and I have one Bob, <laughs> I have one just like it. Uh, this is all because of Bob uh, referring Thanks, to me, Bob. referring to me as the pod father. And I went. I, I tell you, Bob, I can't tell you how much I went back and forth trying to get this design done. And to find a developer that would uh, actually do it from my my really bad uh, idea uh, conception of what it should look like, we went back and forth, back and forth, but it finally worked out. Wood pellets. Let's get back. See, I'm, I'm going to very you know off topic all the time. Wood pellets. I use wood pellets. I still do. I always have. Well, almost always have. I didn't in the beginning for a few months, but then saw one again. Saw one of Russ Wilson's. Uh, Max Scott's videos and how he was using wood pellets. I think he got the recipe from somebody else. I can't remember their name. I apologize. Um, but I use them. But here's the key. Here's the key with, with wood pellets. It's not necessary. It's not necessary immediately with your enclosure. So what is necessary? Well, what's necessary is the dirt or the worm castings, dirt and wood casting or worm worm castings for those speaking English in our, our, uh, our uh, viewing audience, but uh, dirt or worm, worm castings, easy for me to say, and I throw in crushed leaves in there, and uh, what else do I put in there? Little charcoal, okay, maybe sometimes uh, uh, pieces of wood. I love, I love, I love to find dried, uh, rotting wood in the woods, and if it, you can flake it off with your fingers, so I'll take wood and I'll use it in the enclosures. And by the time I'm at, at the bottom of the, the tub of using all the wood, I've got this like wood powder. So I'll take that and I'll mix it in with the substrate. That's really good stuff. The wood pellets are good, but they're good in the long term of this enclosure. So realize this, wood pellets are just simply wood, simply new wood that you're putting into your enclosure into the substrate in your enclosure. Their value from day one is almost zilch. Almost zilch, it just really doesn't have much value. The value comes in like six, or seven or eight months. The value of wood pellets is that they eventually break down. Um, the fibers start breaking down, the cellulose, cellulose starts uh, breaking down and that's what benefits the substrate in the long term and will allow you to go maybe past five or six or seven or eight months, nine months, and extend the life of your substrate just a little bit longer. So that's why we use wood pellets. That's why we use wood pellets. Um, Aquarimax, 
Katz is on. Ah, Ross, I, I've, I've used your name in vain several times. So. They want to know if you fermented oak pellets to make um, fake soil, flake soil. Flake soil? Flake soil is wonderful, and I've read up a lot. I want to get back to what. Uh, okay, make sure you get Russ's question because I'm sure that has a lot of value. But um, flake soil, I don't do because it takes so much time and with so many geckos and isopods and. And just don't have the time, and that's where I get back to finding wood in, in the in the woods and bringing it home and flaking it off and making this wood dust. That's like gold. That's gold. Any of the wood dust where it's just easily flaked off and, and creates the powder. That's what I really, really, really like to put in these enclosures. And again, I'm trying to as much as I possibly can to set up these enclosures. A month before I get new ice and So I'll set them up, I'll seed them with maybe some isopod uh, substrate, just a little bit. Of, I, I did a video on this, but and you can check it. But I seed the uh, new enclosure with some um, sphagnum moss and maybe some um, substrate from an old uh, isopod enclosure. Certainly don't try to bring the isopod, try to minimize, try to eliminate bringing over any isopods into those new enclosures as much as you possibly can. But seed it with, um, seed it with springtails. Let that um, mature out and let it work its way out for about a month or so. And I tell you why, people that, that get isopods, and I get this all the time. Hey, I got isopods and it's been two weeks and they're starting to die off. I'm down to four, what do I do? That's why, that's why, because this is all, all new, new substrate, new wood, new everything. It's just like a fish tank. Yeah, and I mentioned this, and anybody that's watched the video and has seen this, and bear with me with me repeating it, it's just like starting a 10-gallon fish tank and saying, okay, let's go ahead and put the fish in day one. I fill it up with water, I put 14 fish in. Doesn't work. Put one fish in, let the uh, aerobic, anaerobic bacteria work through Put two fish in after a week and make sure you monitor the setup and let that that aquarium seed itself. It's the same exact thing with isopod enclosures. How okay. much do you add to a six quart? Uh, about this, uh, I don't know, about this much, maybe about that much. Um, how much? You've got to go back to one of my videos. I would say, here's a good thing. Here's a better way to say this, and you're going to have to just kind of mix and match and make sure that it works for you. It's probably better to just, if you're gonna make two or three at one time, throw it all into like a 70 quart and mix it all up there. But how much is, it depends. It depends on the isopod. A lot of the isopods, like the Spanish, uh, giant Spanish isopods, don't need a ton of substrate, but they do need to burrow down. The babies certainly need to burrow down. Um, he bears, you know, from from uh, a recent video that uh, Russ had on his channel, uh, it was noted that he bears might need like six inches of substrate. Six inches of sub, what six inches? Is that six inches? Can everybody see that six inches? Uh, so Cuberus needs more substrate than most others. If your um, isopods burrow giant canyons, you want it a little bit deeper. So mix according to the depth that you need for your isopod. Hope that answered the question. How often do you change the dirt? That was the first question. Right now, yeah. I was letting you go. No, it's it, perfect. That's a great question. So I ch change the substrate every six to seven months. I change, hey, boy, this is going to sound horrible. This is going to sound horrible, but I'll start as I'm monitoring these isopods, and maybe some other people do this as well. If I start seeing one isopod, that's off to the side and it's expired. Is that a good word? Expired? Yeah. If, if it's I find, a grown -up word. that's a grown up word. Um, if I found an isopod that has perished um, off to the side, I don't really worry about that too much. If I find, if I go in week to week, I find two or three that are, are gone in the, in, in the enclosure. And the next time, that week before the next feeding, I'm in there changing out as much as possible, as quick as possible, I should say. So I'll set up that new enclosure. And again, this is in another video about a month and a half, two months ago. 
but I'll set up that new enclosure. It, it's, it's getting seeded, it, it's uh, aging, and I see an enclosure that's kind of weak, and it's about been about six, seven, eight months, 10 months, 12 months, somewhere around there, but I start seeing some, some die-offs. Um, that weekend, I'll pull, I'll pull the bark, I'll pull the wood, I'll pull, you know, what I can over to the other enclosure with the animals, and then I'll, I'll pick, you know, out the other animals. I'll put food down, let them gather around the food, and bring them over uh, that way. Sometimes helps a little bit, saves a little bit of time. But I'll let that old enclosure sit there, and I'll pick out. Unfortunately, I'll pick out to the new enclosure, you know, a couple, three, four times couple times a day, just picking one or two here or there until, you know, the other older enclosure is, is completely gone. And sometimes it depends on the isopod, but sometimes I'll put that that enclosure, that tub on the shelf, and I'll kind of let it stew for another couple of months. There might be mankind in there, and the mankind might be growing up. I did this with the um, clowns. I pulled all the clowns out, changed them up, and let it sit for a couple of months, and sure enough, little baby clowns sitting around it, Probably buried. I really, really don't like to dig into the substrate of isopods at, at all, really. So that's that's kind of my procedure. Hope that answers the question. Okay. Do you know if mosquito bits are safe in the isopods in the water? Um, where's a coin? Where's my coin? Um, here's my call. Here's my call. And and, and again, I'm Russ. Sorry, Russ. I keep. Uh, referring to you, I, I, I hope you don't mind. Um, Russ has done a video on this, and it's a superb video, uh, and I don't know what, what um, a Cormax Pets uh, thought on the subject is right now. My thought is that I think there, I feel, what's that? Okay, uh, Russ is saying, uh, what? Go ahead. I no longer recommend um, yes. They work, but may have a long-term effects on animals. Do an arrow, and just do an arrow pointing up to that comment, and we'll just move on. Seriously, Russ, you, you exactly. I didn't, I didn't know if you did or did not recommend them. I just kind of, I didn't want to come right out and say it, but I don't recommend them either because there might be long-term effects. If there's another way around not using chemicals in your Isopods in your geckos, in your fish tanks, in your crusted gecko enclosure, whatever you can. Try to, you know, if there's another way to do it, do it without chemicals. That's my, that's my feeling. Hi, Charles. Hey, Charles. Also, oh, Scott said I should have a shirt too. I didn't get a shirt. I only bought one. That's all I bought. I just bought the one shirt. Um, okay, shameless plug. Uh, again, thank you very much, Bob M, for suggesting the Podfather shirt. Uh, I love the colors. I love the the black and white. Just notice the tie. It's just like it's just like Marlon Brando. You know, I, I'm just, it's just like Marlon Brando. Um, so a shameless plug. These are now available on the uh, on our site, and it should be in the link in the description. Okay, Can moving I have on. To order one. Oh, of course. You know, these things aren't okay, free. Yeah, right away. These things aren't free. They cost money. Or, or, here comes. Ready for You Don't. can make me an offer. Yeah. You can't refuse. I'll make you an offer. Um, <laughs> here is right. a question. Am about, I blushing? Okay, you I'm just blushing. Stop so I can move on here. This one right here. I never say this the right way. Um, Armadillinium, there's thing. First. Hurricane. Hurricane. They have a small colony, four months old now, and they don't see babies yet. How long before the species will see them? Uh, yes, you did. With the hurricane, you, you probably should be seeing babies, but it depends on how small they were when you got them. Were they were they kind of small when you got them? Uh, if they were, then you have to go through that grow up period, and then they have now obviously they have to establish themselves. I never, ever, ever, ever get any animals, geckos, fish. Isopods, and sorry for referring to fish all the time, but my mind goes all the way back to you know 35 years ago when I kept uh, tropical fish, and now I have tropical tropical fish. Yeah, my mind works either a long, long time ago. I remember you know Pink Floyd lyrics from their third album, or 
it doesn't work for what I had for breakfast this morning. So, you know, because there's so much more valuable knowledge in here, like those pink Floyd lyrics. Um, my reference is always back to something to do with keeping tropical fish because it, it kind of relates, it really does. It's all a small enclosed biotype and uh, you know, we're owning, we're managing, we're controlling, we're giving you know the life to these animals. And uh, I know I didn't answer that question whatsoever, but I don't even remember the question anymore. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I If you're not getting babies by this point, if you got fairly uh, larger animals, I would be a little bit concerned about it. And it also depends on how many you got. If you got one, that might be a problem. If you got one, one yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. If you got one, that's a problem. If you got two, you got 50-50 chance of having some, uh, some babies. If you got ten, you, you should see babies by now. You know, it's you should be seeing babies. So message me on Facebook, message me on Instagram, leave a comment after the video in the comments, and and I'll make sure I work with you. And we'll get this fixed. Green gecko pond fish. I think that's what I mean. Um, it's coming. Not not that name. Not that name, but the whole fish thing is coming. So if you're really into fish, if you if you think fish are cool like I do, um, it's it's coming. It's coming. Hopefully next month. I've got two huge projects coming in the works. Finally got this shirt done, so now I can move on to another another uh, project. But the fish thing is going to happen, and it's going to happen hopefully next month. <laughs> oh my God! Who said that? Who said that? Brandon Brunch. Outstanding. You get my, you get my, for this video, you get my two thumbs up outstanding <laughs> from the Cod Father. Will babies outcompete the adults? Um, who's saying that, Bob? Um, I can answer every single question with. It depends. It oh. really depends. Um, it depends on how many babies. I mean, if you're if you're looking at zebras and you have you know ten adults and a thousand babies, those babies are obviously going about the, the the adults. But in a normal setup, you really shouldn't see babies out competing the adults. You really shouldn't. Um, no. But but speaking of parquet, um, I know I had two enclosures going at one time, and they were just full. Of like swarming with with uh, adults and babies, and one of them started to, like I said before, one of them started to kind of slow down. And you know, looking at the enclosure, it was because there were a ton, a ton of uh, little tiny babies in that enclosure. So just kind of be aware of that. We're next is a video coming out soon about the fungus snatch predator, uh, which is compatible with isopods. And of course. So, so here's my response to that whole fungus snap, and I'll compare my response with Ross. So my response right from like the beginning was, I don't know, I don't want to put chemicals, and I don't know long term effect, and nobody's. So that's not one bit of science based. All of my experiences from just kind of doing the wrong thing over and over and over for many many years, and finally. You know, getting it in, in stuck in my head not to do it anymore. So I'm not a big fan of using chemicals. So that's where my experience goes. Ross, on the other hand, and, and I do the research too, and I'll dig into it. But I mean, Ross can tell you the scientific name of the the fungus snap and and just stuff like that just escapes me. Now, if we're talking about tropical fish, I'll, I'll stay with anybody for, for names, but I mean, Russ is down to the science part of this, and that's what's great about this hobby is some people can focus on, on Arbutolidium maculatum, and just that's what they love and that's what they enjoy, and Russ is really into the scientific, and it's just, you know, it's a blessing to the community that we have somebody like this that, that knows so much about um, the details of 
of this information. And, and I just kind of play it by ear and, and I and they type it, you know, shiny, shiny objects and bells and whistles kind of draw my attention. So that's where we're at with that. Is it my freak junior says hi? Hey, is that, uh, is that Scott? I suppose I'm a freak, but it's junior. I, I know he's isopod freak. I didn't know he was a junior. I didn't know there was an official isopod freak. Maybe that's Scott Westley's son, maybe. Um, any more questions? Yeah, they want to know if I have any pets of my own. Um, basically, the only pet I have is a dog that doesn't like me. Um, <laughs> other than that, no, I don't. I do enjoy going down low and working with the Pictus. Those are probably my favorites down there. But no. And somebody said that you were my pet. But... I don't listen to you either. I'm just like, oh, so. no, those. I do, I do respond to treats though. So, so if you say, Wally, come in the kitchen and help me do the dishes, I get some chocolate chips. I go, blah, 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 Wally, blah, blah, <laughs> blah, 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 chocolate chips, blah, 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 kitchen. I'm on it. <laughs> hey, there's no real question. Okay. <laughs> You're finished, you know. I see Wally, Scott's okay. Animal Adventures here, another great, great channel. Make sure you visit Scott's. Animal Adventures, wonderful channel. Um, let me talk. What's that? Go ahead. Revolutious. Revolutious. Yeah. Revolutious. Yeah. Hello, Revolutious. Four oh seven. That's interesting. Four oh seven. Um, so substrate. Uh, we talked about the pellets. Uh, I didn't really talk much about the charcoal. And and I started using charcoal. I started using orchid bark. Kind of gotten away from those a little bit. If I have them available, I'll throw them into the enclosure, into the substrate in the enclosure. If I don't have them, I'm not going to make a special run to Stein's Gardens, uh, plants and gardens. I'm not going to make a special run to go get charcoal and. This is true. Um, where's my phone, Nanette? You're out of orchid <laughs> bark. Um, so I won't make a special run, nor Nanette, um, to a store to get uh, materials like that. So, so you're asking, where are the main materials? So A++ plus 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 is obviously the dirt and the worm casting. I like to mix dirt and worm castings. That works out very, very well for me. So that's above and beyond. You need a good, clean uh, base for your, for your substrate. So I'll go probably... And, and somebody's going to go to, off to one of my latest videos on creating substrate and say, yeah, well, these numbers are all off from his live stream to that video. It's all off. Anyways, I use probably about 60% dirt worm castings. I probably use about um, 30%. And this, this number probably won't add up to 100 either. There's no way it's going to. So, so let's go with 60% and then another probably... Uh, 30%. I use jungle mix and I love, I love jungle mix. It's a good um, moisture retaining uh, material. Uh, Zilla jungle mix. Zilla, Zilla, are you watching? Um, maybe you can be a sponsor. Um, so I use Zilla jungle mix. Uh, so what are we at? 60, 70, 80, 90. What are we at? Not like 90%. So on top of that, I'll, I'll take these. I'll take these and I'll crush them up. And I'll mix that into the substrate, and I'll try to bury them as much as I possibly can. Um, I use calcium, so 15 quart. I'll probably dump in maybe a tablespoon, maybe two tablespoons of calcium, um, and then I use a garden product uh, lime. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, uh, organic lime. Um, so I'll add that as well. I'm trying to think of anything else that I add to my substrate now, but that's that's pretty much it. So I get the substrate down, I get the sphagnum moss, and I try to keep at least 20% of the enclosure with sphagnum moss. If I have an animal like a Florida fast that require more humidity, more moisture, then I might go 40 or 50% of the enclosure with sphagnum moss. So that's the number two uh, piece in this whole enclosure. And obviously number three is some kind of a bark with a concave Look at so that the can get up and under 
that bar. I like to, and, and if anybody watches my videos, they, they know what I'm going to say next. I like that bar sitting right over the moist area. This this is moist area. So I like this the sphagnum moss. I like that bark sitting over the sphagnum moss and then uh, transcending, uh, going into, yeah, how about that? Wow. So then I like the, the bark uh, moving into the dry area so the isopods can transcend, transport. They can go between the dry area and the moist area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the Were word of the day. Crystal today. Do you have any advice for a <clears throat> Bulgari orange Dalmatian for their setup? Bulgari orange Dalmatians? Yeah. Um, oh, that's to go to High Dakota. Um, oh. I'm going to talk about Bulgari. Um, the biggest thing. For me, for them, isn't so much the setup. I don't do anything really specific for Armored Illudium, Bulgari, Punta Canas, uh, uh, Albinos, uh, Golden Slano. I really don't do anything special. I give them a little bit more moisture. Um, same sphagnum moss, same, you know, not quite as much dry area, same bark, same everything. And when I talk about the substrate and making the enclosure, I do at the end throw in some eggshells and maybe a you know some more calcium and a little pile on the side. But for the Armadillo Living Bulgari, I really don't do any for all of them. I don't do anything really special. What's special about them though that I do do differently is I feed them a lot of vegetables, a lot of vegetables, a lot of protein. So protein, we give dried mealworms, we give dried fish. We give the, uh, the the shrimp. We give the shrimp. Um, we give the say it with me. What blatant uh, advertisement for Supreme Gecko Chow? We give them the Supreme Isified Chow, um, and uh, we give we feed a lot of crusted geckos. So we have the crusted gecko diet, and I use dishes where you can virtually uh, let the dishes sit out at the crust. So get them so eat all of the food and then let them sit out for a, a couple of days and just take the, the dried food and, and put it into a bowl. I crush it up and that's great, great source of food for the isopods as well. He doesn't throw anything out. You I throw stuff out. Not much. Well, isopods eat pork bark. Now somebody else came back and said, Frank came back and said that he's never seen him eat it. But he has seen the spring tear nibble on it. So, uh, will they eat cork bark? And Frank is orchid, or orchid bark. Cork bark. I might have bark. said cork bark. Well, no, you probably orchid said orchid bark. bark. Um, they shouldn't. I'll, I'll say it that way. They really shouldn't. You should have enough of other food items in the enclosure that they shouldn't ever eat. The, the orchid bark. Um, however, you know, two two other situations are going to be so I'm doing the it depends again. So two other situations will occur where they might eat the orchid bark or where they might eat the orchid bark. Uh, number one, there's just so many in there and you don't have enough food for them. So they're gonna try to find whatever they can find. If there's no leaves, if there's no other bark, they're gonna eat that that orchid bark. Number two situation is that orchid bark is sat in that enclosure uh, and the substrate has uh, matured past the point of being nutritious or and have no nutritional value whatsoever. That orchid bark is still sitting in there. It's going to start breaking down the cellulose and, and the fibers are going to break, start breaking down and they are going to start eating it. But under normal situations, they, they really shouldn't be eating that. That uh, orchid bark. Ever feed dead fruit flies to isopods? I use them for my frogs, but I sometimes have to get rid of some to avoid the culture crash. Just thinking about freezing and drying them. Uh, there's a key. There's the key word right there. You want to make sure that you absolutely freeze them. My concern with fruit flies, I'm going to talk about two different things with, with other foods, and especially fruit flies, is uh, what a, who said that? 
Let's try RC. Let's try RC. Thanks for the question, RC. That's a, an absolutely wonderful question. So my response to that is um, the key word there is freezing it. Um, I know I've had fruit fly cultures in the past that, um, this is years and years, years ago, that have developed mites. And you basically take it out to the roof, to, to the driveway, open the garbage can and throw it away. And you don't try to save it, you don't try to, you get rid of that the second that you get those mites in a fruit fly container and you throw it away, you dump it, you get rid of those or else mites are gonna be all over. I am so fortunate that I don't, I get this question a lot too. What do you do about mites? Um, the thing with mites is they, they will, they will like, like uh, tribbles in Star Trek, they, they're just all over the place. One becomes two becomes a thousand within seconds. So that's a big problem. And Bill, um, I don't know if they um, cause any issues with the isopods, but what they will do is they'll cause a disturbance in the enclosure, um, and they'll certainly take up, you know, they'll, they'll take up nutrients in the enclosure. They'll, they'll eat food. So I don't like mites in any anything and I get rid of whatever I have if I ever get mites. I haven't had mites in probably you know three or four years. Anyways, freezing even in the freezer for, for some time or baking will um you know if you can nuke it um will take care of that mite problem. The second thing is I get I have I have I swear to goodness that I have a folder on my computer of questions not just to me but also to the Facebook isopod groups asking, can I feed, I wish I could bring this up right now. Can I feed this, can I feed this? My iguana, dot, my my crested gecko lost its tail. Can I feed the tail? Yes, yes. So isopods love decaying leaves. Isopods love decaying wood. Isopods are clean up crew. Clean up crew means that they'll eat just about anything organic. So. The point being is that you can pretty much feed anything to your isopods and get some nutritional value out of those meals. Um, this folder, I, I plan to do a video on all of the different foods that I've seen. I guess I have a hundred different uh, listings of different types of foods. And, and a lot of them are, can I feed zucchini? Can I feed uh, red peppers? Can I feed, you know, this and uh, fruit flies, a great example. Um, I will feed um, gecko eggs. I'm not feeding, I'm giving them a, a calcium, a, an additional calcium source. But if I have a, uh, some, if I have the uh, time, and if I have some bad eggs, or some gecko eggs, or leopard gecko eggs, or small, you know, rare geckos, I'll put them in addition. I'll go in and put an egg in each, you know, container if I can. Just as an addition. It doesn't hurt at all. A key though is, you know, especially if you're using something that's notorious for having mites, get it in the freezer, get it in a microwave, and nuke it, and and then you can then you can feed it. As long as you're not feeding something that's going to mold up right away and cause issues in your enclosure. Do you recommend making fish flake to put the mites? Um, I'll say it like this: you should bake anything that you're going to feed to your enclosures. And eliminate any kind of a potential form. Do I? I don't. I really don't. Um, I keep my flake food. Here's the key with mites. You know, with fruit flies, obviously you have the the uh, medium on the bottom, and the medium is moist. So fruit flies don't do well with a real dry uh, environment. So you have to have that moisture in the enclosure. Moisture stimulates the the, the breeding uh, and the, the occurrence and the breeding of mites. So if your plate, fish plate food is sitting in a dry, uh, tight lid kind of container, um, you really shouldn't have a problem with mites. But I tell you what, if, if I found mites in my uh, fish plate, I would certainly take the whole bucket, dump it into a glass horse thing, and throw it in the, the microwave and nuke it out. In my kitchen? Of course not. I would never think of doing that. I would never think of using one of your knives or your uh, your one cup measuring. Do you have any of those? I have 
<laughs> so we were downstairs the other day, and <laughs> we were downstairs the other day, and over by one sink in the, the gecko room, I had how many how many spoons? Probably a dozen. And at the other sink? A dozen. Yeah. How many in my kitchen? Two. That's all you need, though, really. Oh, yeah. Right? Now I'm going to go out and buy new silverware. I already bought. And so I, so she didn't, Nanette never complains about something like that. Um, so, you know, we were at the sink and, and I saw the spoons mounting up. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I took all of your spoons out of the kitchen. So that night I went on Amazon and, and found a couple of other spoons. Where, what, 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 where was that getting back to? I have no idea. So somebody wanted to know. Oh, are you going to give an update on the man kids? Um, I have a video. I have a, I'll give a, an update right now. Um, I have a video of feeding them food. So I fed them. I, should I even break this or should I just show the video? I, I'll probably do the video in the next few weeks. Um, on my Friday, I usually do a Friday isopod and a Tuesday. And it's been more Wednesday for geckos because I just run out of time during the week. But I think I'll put out that mantis uh, feeding video because I fed them all kinds of different food. But I fed them one food that I really, really shouldn't have. And I think it caused some problems. So I'm down to two mantises. And they're doing good. I have them up in, I can see the potato right now. They're, they're I don't know, maybe a couple, a couple inches or so. These are the spiny flower mantises, and they're doing well. Um, but I probably won't breed them. You know, the whole intent of, and I got these uh, from Peter at Bugs in Cyberspace. Uh, he sent over, you know, I was very fortunate, he was very, very, very generous, and he sent over three, and it's been such a blast working with them. Uh, but I probably won't, I, my intent was to work with them and try to breed them. Everything that I have, I feel like. I am a success only if I breed the animals and I can replicate, you know, what's going on in nature. But anyways, I probably won't breed these because I'm down to it. I just don't want to, I don't want to go through that. And I know that there's, just like with tarantulas, there's a potential for, for some not such good activity going on with, uh, with tarantulas and certainly with mantises as well. So that's my update. I hope that was sufficient. I hope that's what you were Okay. Um, wood. Let's talk about wood. And if anybody saw the, the post that I did, the little announcement, I did isopod setups. I, I tried to make the isopods kind of the, the texture of the wood. I, I thought that was fun. Mm -hmm. And the um, setups then, uh, like sphagnum moss, that was, that was fun to do. Anyways, wood. So... Um, I don't know what everybody's using in their enclosures. Um, I think it's very important to use two types of wood, or maybe just one for the intent of being two different, uh, handling two different requirements. Number one is hiding places, obviously. Um, maybe even three requirements. Number one is hiding places. Number two is to maintain the humidity in that area, in a, <clears throat> excuse me, in an area. And again, if my Sphagnum moss, sphagnum moss with that wood is covering the sphagnum moss, then it's holding in that humidity underneath that piece of wood. So, uh, number one is hiding places, number two is to hold in that humidity over the, the moist area. And if anybody's uh, watching this, they know that if I say moist area, you have to take a drink. And number three purpose is. To or wood in, in an enclosure, when I slide enclosure, is to provide them with additional food. But that wood, and I think everybody knows where I'm going with this, that wood, and I think it was Frank that asked, will they eat the pork part? It really won't. So that wood should be really decaying wood. If you can go out to the woods and you can find a dry piece of wood and flakes off in your hand, you know, that flaking off is great to add to your substrate piece of that decaying wood in your enclosure in addition to your cork bark or your tree bark. I love, I love going to parks. I love finding fallen trees, fallen trees, fallen trees, 
fallen trees, and I love it when they've been sitting there. And I'll mark in my mind, you know, I, I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, but I'll mark in my mind where those trees have fallen, and I'll come back in a month or so, and the wood will start cracking away from the, the tree. The bark will start uh, pulling away from the tree. And I'll go and I'll grab, you know, pieces of wood. I did a video on this too. I'll grab pieces of wood, and I'll take my saw, my saw, and I'll cut that wood into smaller pieces. And the bark coming off the trees is great for two reasons. Number one, you know, you have just, a, well, it's free. Three reasons. Number one, most important is it's free. Number two, it's a nice concave um, look to the wood because it's going to stay on the tree. If it uh, has too much of a concave, you know, if you're pulling from a smaller tree, then Throw you know a, a one pound weight on it in the garage and let it sit there for a couple of days. It'll kind of go down a little bit, and you can use that wood that way. Make sure they're untreated. Make sure they're untreated. So the parks that I go to, you know, I'm looking at in the woods. I'm looking in the woods. I'm not looking at the side where they're they're manicuring. Um, these are kind of way off, you know, on the side kind of situation. So good good point. Really good point. Uh, you don't want to. Pull any materials into your enclosure that could be treated with any kind of a, a chemical product. Have I said that enough already? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Any comments? Um, for a while. So the the bark, I, I love the bark coming off of trees. Make sure you're using also, you know, decaying wood. Now, if that decaying wood serves instead of cork bark, that's that's fine. How are we doing on time? You can speak so closely. Yeah. I haven't tried sagebrush. Sagebrush? Sagebrush. Bob, go ahead and try it and let me know how that works for you. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll. Um, any other questions about isopod setups, um, specific to you know putting them together? Um, I think I've covered that. A lot of different points here tonight. A lot of great questions. Um, we are intensely listening. Um, I, I stopped listening to myself talk, you know, like 20 minutes ago. So if people are. Oh, wow. Um, if there's any other questions, we'll go ahead and field those questions. If not, um, I would suggest. You know, I said this earlier, Russ uh, from Aquarimax Pets has some great videos. I have a couple of videos out there on mixing substrates. The principles are pretty much the same. Um, after a while, the substrate just goes bad, so you have to you have to uh, you have to uh, uh, trade it out and uh, start with a new substrate. There was a comment in here. Oh, um, link that video afterward, please. It's a great video. Do you know which one he's talking about? I'll put into the comments and I'll pin uh, oh, the comments. Yep. I have uh, a couple. One, one is called something about eviction. Minutes. Eviction. And another is getting, I think it's something about getting three isopods and putting together substrate. But yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll put that in a comment and I'll pin it for this video. Um, I um, think we brought up a lot of good questions here. I hope I've answered everybody's questions. I've had a bunch of fun. I love doing these lives. Sorry about the technical issues earlier on. Uh, we're working those and maybe, maybe we will have those fixed for the next video and uh, just try to keep improving for everybody. Um, love having everybody here. Love the support in the community. This is such a great community. I really appreciate everybody. Uh, joining in tonight and uh, supporting us. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other comments, so at this point, I'll just say thank you very much, everybody, and have a good weekend and enjoy the warm weather. It's coming. Bye bye. There you go. Yeah, you did. You got somebody else. Question.